Welcome to Taylor Chapel. A couple lines out of that song struck me as something right in the line of the sermon. I thought I was too far gone. So you're looking forward to a great message this morning. I heard it first service, and uh, normally your, ser your sermon's even better second, so they're, they're in line for a great time here. Angela, you want to come up and share the life of the community? tell anybody. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, my dad is in his final stages of Parkinson's and he's in home hospice. And um, for Father's Day, I went to visit him and I thought, you know, I cannot get him a, a Sears craft, craftsman tool. You know, he's, we're, we're not there anymore. <clears throat> and, uh, I, and I knew what I needed to do. So when we get there, I had a nice visit. And at the end of the visit, I, I pulled out a footstool and I sat in front of him and I told him what he meant to me as a father and what all he had done for me in my life. And I wasn't even sure he could hear me because he wouldn't make eye contact with me and he was just kind of looking off. And, and then I got to the part and I said, and dad, I want you to know that your part in my faith and my walk in life was that every Sunday you made sure I came to church. And it was because it was important and he immediately looked at me and he cried. And it, I just knew it was the best Father's Day gift I could give him was to tell him how much I loved him and what he meant to me. And if 
Five days later, my, Derek and I go down to visit him again. And I had found out at age 74 he had never been baptized. And he asked to receive Jesus Christ in his life this week. <laughs> and he was baptized at age 74. So don't, don't ignore a nudge when you need to tell someone what Jesus does in your life. And this week, my dad is in single or dub, double digit J's on this earth. But I, I don't know what's in store for me. But I'm going to be so happy because I know that him and I are going to be with Jesus forever. And forever is a long time. Eternity is a long time. So if you want to know what it means to be a disciple, it means to share. Share with others what love is because God is love and, and just don't ignore nudges. So he's our rescuer, right guys? Right. So I wanted to share that with you this week. I'm just so happy. <laughs> All right, stand as you're able. We're going to sing a couple of praise songs. He's our rescuer, he's our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore, oh how sweet the sound, oh how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. There is good news for the captive. Thank you for our church. Help us to 
to do all the right things to keep it safe for our little ones and safe for our elderly. Lord, we ask that you come in and, and uh, your spirit be in our souls today as we listen to these words from Pastor Derek. Open our hearts and open our minds that we can, we can hear your word through his voice. Father, we ask these things in your name. Amen. church. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, and uh, uh, I'm especially glad that Angel is back with me. I missed her this week really bad. <laughs> yeah. I'm not the same without her. And uh, Yeah, it was pretty amazing that I got to baptize Angel as dad. It's one of the coolest things I've ever been a part of. And uh, you, you have to ask people. You know, I, I I didn't know what to do. And you know what? I love this man. And it's like, why in the world wouldn't I want to just make sure? You know? And you don't think he didn't notice that I loved him and that's why I asked him? You know? He knew I wasn't trying to nose into his business or be too pushy, these pushy Christian people, self-righteous. No, he knew better than that. He knew I loved him and that's why I, I asked him. And I told him, I said, I, I'm, and I don't want you to just say yes because I'm asking you. Oh, no. He wanted to. He wanted to. You got to ask. You know, you got to ask. Anyway, th th this morning I'm, I'm excited to uh, say uh, two years ago this Sunday, 
third Sunday, I, uh, I stood before the Taylor Chapel group. It was a little larger than this group. We weren't all having diseases and riots and plagues. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, um, and I, uh, I preached on one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Maybe my favorite. It's, it's my favorite parable, I believe. Uh, the story of two sons. We call it the story of the prodigal son. But that's not what it is. I, I, it's always kind of had a... You know, this story is about so much more than one son that ran off and blew money and acted irresponsible. It, it's, it's so much more than that. Uh, the, the story of the first son is a, a story of somebody who comes home. He comes back. And he, he pushes down his pride, and he comes back anyway, not expecting anything, but he gets so much more than he expected. And that's what grace is, unmerited favor. Getting something that you didn't earn, you didn't pay for, you don't deserve, but getting it anyway. That's what grace is. And uh, this story tells... Uh, the, the, the prodigal in the story is not the son. The prodigal is the, actually the father, you see? Because prodigal means somebody who is uh, extravagant with their giving, uh, you know, and we, and we want to look at this son as prodigal because he uh, gives away all this money. No, the father's the prodigal. The, the father's the one that's extravagant, that forgives both of these sons who act ridiculous. The second son, we don't even, you know, mention him. He was the good son, you know, the one that stayed home and minded the farm. But he was resentful. And he certainly didn't want his brother coming home. What do you mean? He's going to get treated the same way as me? After all I've done? The story's about the father. The father's love is what the highlight of the story is, and we so overlook that. So anyway, today we're going to look at the first son, and over the next few weeks, we'll, we'll look at the other parts of the story. But uh, this is a story about grace. It's about grace. And uh, I saw a, I read a story uh, uh, several years ago. It was a kind of a cute little story uh, about grace. And uh, I want to share it with you this morning. And I'd like to share it with the kids. So uh, if the kids would come up... Uh, you can stay over on this side, and I'll stay on that side. Come on up, kids. Come on up, Gracie. Yeah, scoot on down a little bit. Scoot on down a little bit, Tony. Hi, Jackson. Hi, Gracie. You know, and what's so cool about this story is it's a story about two kids that went to go visit their grandpa and grandma, and guess what their names were? Jackson and Gracie. Can you believe it? Isn't that something? How, what a coincidence. And, oh, oh, we got other kids. Come on up here. Oh, my goodness. Let's see them all. Have a seat. Have a seat. Oh, this warm. Oh, my goodness. My heart is, my heart is pounding. Holy oh, Zoe. Hi, Zoe. How are you, baby? Well, anyway, Jackson, you got to listen to the story because it's about you and Gracie, okay? Well, anyway, Jackson and Gracie lived in the city, and they went out to visit Grandma and Grandpa, who had this beautiful farm out in the country. And while they were going out to the farm, Grandpa met them as soon as they got there, and Grandpa said, Jackson, come here. And Jackson come running over because he was excited to see Grandpa. He goes, I got a present for you. Guess what present you got, Jackson? A slingshot, just like this one. See? You know how a slingshot works. He does. You put rocks in here, you know, and you shoot it. You aim it and you shoot it. My brother has one and Goliath. Yeah, like David and Goliath was kind of like. My brother has one, but his is blue, and there's a little ball that comes with it. Oh, I'm so happy. Praise God. Isn't this how it's supposed to be? <laughs> this is how it's supposed to be. Anyway, let me try to tell the story, Jackson. So anyway, Jackson gets, gets the slingshot, and Grandpa looks at him and says, Jackson, here's what I want you to do. He goes, take this can and go set it on that fence post, and you practice with rocks shooting until you knock that can off. And Jackson was all excited. You were excited, weren't you? Because you wanted to knock those rocks off. So Jackson goes over, and Gracie's just kind of watching. And Jackson's over there, and he's shooting, 
and he can't hit the can. And he shoots again, and he misses the can, and he shoots, and he shoots, and he shoots. He never did hit the can, did he, Gracie? He couldn't hit the can at all. And Jackson was kind of frustrated. He said, I can't even believe this. And about that time, Grandma sticks her head out the window, and she says, Gracie and Jackson, come on in for dinner. And Jackson is kind of disgusted because he hadn't hit the can yet. He wanted to practice some more. So he's walking across the barnyard kind of going like this. And just about that time, a whole group of ducks come walking across the pasture. And Jackson looks over there, and he just takes his slingshot, and he just goes, swoop. And he hits Grandma's favorite duck right in the head with a rock and kills it. Oh, Jackson. And Jackson goes, I, 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 couldn't even hit, I couldn't even hit a can, let alone one of these ducks that's walking. I didn't mean to kill the duck. I'm so upset. He was so sad, and he felt bad, didn't you? He felt so bad about killing the duck. And then he thinks, oh, now he panicked. What's he going to do? What am I going to do? Grandma's going to see that her duck's missing, and she'll be so sad. I don't know what I'll do. And he looks over, and he sees a wood pile. And he thinks, Maybe he can make one out of wood and carve it. No, he can't carve one. He says, he says, I think I no, he goes over and he takes the duck and he pulls up some pieces of wood and he puts the duck in the wood pile and he covers it up and walks away. And he feels really bad, but not as bad as he does when he looks over and notices one thing. Gracie saw the whole thing. Gracie saw the whole thing. So anyway, they go in to eat their dinner, and they don't say a word. And they're sitting down at the dinner table eating, and Gracie's just having a good old time eating her food and smiling. But Jackson's over, and he's all sheepish and sad, and he feels funny. He doesn't say much. And when dinner's over, Grandma says, Gracie, I need you to help me to pick up the dishes and wash the dishes. And you know what Gracie does? She looks over at Jackson, and she says, Grandma, Jackson said he wanted to wash the dishes tonight. Didn't you, Jackson? Don't forget the duck. <gasps> and Jackson realizes he's getting blackmailed. So the next morning, they get up to have breakfast, and they go down to the breakfast table, and Gracie's all smiling and happy, and Jackson's still kind of sad and feeling bad, and they sit to eat. And Grandpa comes in, and he says, Jackson, after breakfast, we're going to go down to the pond and catch some catfish. Won't that be fun? And, and Gracie, says, Gracie says, well, I want to go too. And Grandma looks over at Gracie and says, Gracie, you can't go because we're going to learn how to bake pies this morning. And Gracie sat there for a second. She goes, no, Grandma, me and Jackson already talked. And Jackson wants to learn how to bake pies. Don't you, Jackson? Don't forget the duck. Jackson says, yeah, I want to bake pies. Anyway, this goes on all day long. Jackson's doing his chores and Gracie's chores, and he's feeling really bad about it. And, and he gets to the point where he just, he feels so guilty about what he, he'd done, and he felt so bad, but he doesn't know what to say. And he doesn't know if he should say something to Grandma or not. Finally, Jackson goes up to Grandma, and he says, Grandma, I'm so sorry. I got to tell you something. I had the slingshot, and I didn't mean to. And I really didn't do it on purpose, but I killed your duck. I hit it with a rock, and I, I, I'm so sorry. And Grandma looked at him, and she says, Jackson, I forgive you. I already knew all about it. I was looking out the window, and I saw the whole thing happen. And Jackson says, well, why didn't you say anything? Why didn't you punish me? And Grandma looked at Jackson, and she said, I just wanted to see how long that you would be willing to be Gracie's slave. Yeah, Gracie. I think you need to ask Grandma to forgive you. I'm just kidding. Anyway. Oh, they, they had duck for dinner. So. <laughs> he thought they had milk and quackers. <laughs> he, he thought they had milk and quackers. That's a great one. Anyway, hey, let's round it up, kids. Okay, now listen real quick. Here's the, 
Here's the, what I want you to know about this story. You know, Grandma saw what happened, and she'd already forgiven Jackson. She, she liked her duck, but she loved Jackson because Jackson was her grandson, and she loved him. And she'd already willing to forgive him. She, she, she was ready to forgive him. You know, God is the same way. God sees everything we do. You can't hide anything from God. He sees it all, right? He sees everything we do. So what should we do? We should tell God we're sorry when we mess up. We should not be afraid to go to God and ask for forgiveness. And every single time, since you're his children, he's going to forgive you. That's why Jesus came. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for each and every one of us so that we would be forgiven and be made right. So you are always forgiven. I want you to remember that, okay? There's nothing that you can do that's so bad that God won't forgive you. If you have something happen, tell your mom, tell your dad, and then always ask God. You can pray to him and say, God, forgive me for what I've done. And when you do, it's gone, right? Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? Zoe, isn't that a wonderful thing? I knew you'd agree. Let's pray. Everybody close their eyes and bow their heads, okay? Dear God, we just thank you so much for Jesus that we can be forgiven because of what he's done for us. Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you that you forgive us. Help us to do good, but help us to also be quick to ask for forgiveness. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, kids. Let's hear it for the kids. That was the most normal thing I've done since March. Oh, didn't it feel good to lose control? Grace. Unmerited favor. It's the gift that we receive from God. He loves us. He forgives us. And he made a way for us through Jesus. That's the gospel. That is the good news. Grace is the good news. I, I uh, want to start my sermon this morning by uh, repeating this uh, interesting uh, idea that, that I was given when I was in seminary school. One of my professors uh, said that at the beginning of one of her classes, and I don't know who initially wrote it. She said she wasn't the author, and she didn't know where she'd heard it, but it's very simple, and I want you all to listen to it and really take in what I'm saying here because it's so simple and it's so true. And I hope that if you take this into your heart that uh, it will help you to remember to ask and, and talk to people more. Uh, the, the saying goes as this. It says, heaven, heaven is full of redeemed sinners. Hell is full of redeemed sinners who just don't know it. You hear me? Heaven is full of redeemed sinners. Hell is full of redeemed sinners who don't know it. Jesus died for everyone. His blood is powerful. Forgives everyone. His grace is sufficient. He didn't die for a small group of people. There's so much power in his blood, it can cover all of us. All of us. The only difference is some people just don't know it. They don't ask for it. You know, that, that's the thing about this grace that we receive. It's such a wonderful gift, but you have to receive it. You have to, to take it on. You have to accept it. You have to make it a part of you. You have to share it with other people. Who doesn't want to be forgiven? Who doesn't want to feel separated from their sin? Even if they don't see it as sin, even if they just look at it as a negative thing in their life, who doesn't want to be separated from the negativity that they carry with them? I mean, people go to see psychologists and counselors all the time to do this in a, in a non-spiritual way. They pay a fortune 
to, to try to separate themselves from their malfunctions and all their, their failings in life. When all they really need to do is seek out Christ and ask for forgiveness. And know that they're forgiven. Accept that forgiveness. Realize that forgiveness. Take it in. Live in it. It's what you need to do. Grace is the good news. That's the good news. And, and as Methodists, we, our theology is built on and around the notion of grace. That's what I do love about our doctrine and our theology. You know, we, we show this by how we feel about uh, the Lord's Supper. Everybody is welcome. Anybody that's sitting in this room is always welcome at the table. We make room at the table for any and everybody. You don't have to prove yourself. You, you don't have to be a certain age. You, you, you don't have to, uh, to be sober for so many years. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been. You are welcome at the table. And you're always welcome at the, the kingdom's table. And I think that is so Christ-like. Jesus left the 99 to seek out the one. Sometimes I'm the one, and he seeked me out. For that, I'm grateful. John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Church, he struggled desperately with the whole notion of grace. He, he spent his whole life struggling with it. You know, his, our, our, our church was started as what was called the Holiness Club. Okay? When he was in college, you know, instead of joining a fraternity... <laughs> He started the Holiness Club. I mean, that's the kind of guy he was, okay? Righteousness, righteousness, seeking out righteousness. And this, this club gathered and they met to keep each other accountable. You know, it, it was a group of guys who met and they talked about the things that they struggled with and they kept each other accountable and they prayed and they worshiped and, and they were so methodical about this that they started becoming known as the Methodists which was a put-down, so the name of our church is a slur. <laughs> kind of nice to know, isn't it? But even though he felt this way, he never did feel completely forgiven. He never did feel like that, that he had, had fully been received. He struggled with this notion of grace his whole life. And, you know, and I think it's great that a person cares enough about being righteous, that they worry about that. But it can be extremely damaging to you spiritually if you do not accept the forgiveness that's offered to you. Christ died so that you could be forgiven. The least you could do is accept it. You know? Wesley came to the United States. He was, he was going to... Uh, uh, become a uh, missionary to the native people in the colony that's now Georgia, in, in the Georgia colony. And he came thinking that he was going to do all this miraculous stuff and, and, and uh, uh, do all this great work. And he, he was stationed to, to go into Savannah, Georgia. And uh, while he was on the ship coming over, there was a horrible storm and uh, the winds blew and uh, the, the boat was going up and down and up and down. And, and he was scared silly he was scared to death and the whole group that he was with that had come from england were terrified some of them were quaking and crying because they just knew they were going to be smashed and during this whole thing he looks over and he sees this group of moravians uh, these moravian believers from germany and uh, they're heading over to the united states as well and he looks and he sees them and what do they do they're they're praising god and singing hymns and he says oh my gosh What's wrong with me that this is what my faith looks like and this is what their faith looks like and it shook him it shook him deeply and when he got to the united states and he gets to savannah it didn't work out very well for him at all the pioneer people uh the, the colonial people they didn't like him he was kind of kind of self-righteous they, they didn't care much for john wesley and uh, they thought they thought he was rude and snooty and he never could connect with the native people. And uh, it just, it, 
just things got worse and worse, and, and, and just over a year, he, he couldn't take any more, and he, he decided to go back to England, and he went back to England defeated. Defeated. All the time, thinking that his failure was a punishment because of his sin and his lack of faith. He struggled with grace. He struggled with it. And as an older person, when he got back, he prayed about it, and he read everything he could about it. And, and the book of Romans talks a lot about it. And, and on, a, on an evening when he didn't want to go, he was going to go to see a Martin Luther reading on the preface of the epistle of the Romans, book of Romans. And, and it was being at, at a place called Eldersgate. Sounds like a fun evening, doesn't it? And as he was walking, he'd been praying about it. And he said, about a quarter till nine, this is what he said in his own words, while I was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warm. This movement of the Holy Spirit. And I felt that I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation and an an insurance. An assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine. And he saved me from the law of sin and death. He was in his 30s when he finally got saved, I guess, like the song this morning. He'd, he'd gone through the whole holy club. He'd been a missionary. He'd done all these things. And, and finally, not in some miraculous moment, nothing came down from the sky, uh, no lightning bolts or anything, no voice of God. He felt strangely warmed in his heart. The Holy Spirit touched him. And look what his movement has done through the face of Christianity in the history of the United States and for that matter, all over the world. He was strangely warm. He understood grace. He, Wesley studied grace, and he understood grace in, in three ways. Provenient grace, justified grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. And the way Wesley saw it is that we all are on the spectrum, starting with provenient grace, all the way to sanctifying grace, and you will find yourself somewhere on that spectrum at all times. And provenient grace is where it starts. And, and the idea of provenient grace is simply this. Provenient grace is God reaching out, seeking you without you being involved. God seeks you out. God lures you. God shows you. God. God makes himself known to you whether you are involved in it or not. Some people, I don't know about that. I know about it. I know when, when I was four years old, my mom and dad used to go to this poker party club every other week on Saturdays, and over at one of their friends' house in their fancy, fancy living room that the kids weren't allowed in. Of course, I didn't pay any attention to that kind of nonsense. And uh, they had a picture of Jesus that was lit on the wall of Jesus praying in the garden. You've seen that scene. It's so beautiful. You know, the, the old classic Jesus is on his knees up by the big rock, and he's praying in the garden. And they had that picture in their living room, and I stood in front of it in awe. And I didn't know who Jesus was. I'd never heard of anything to do with religion. I had no, no concept, but I seen it, and, and it touched me, and I, I, I've never forgotten it. I've never forgotten it. It was the beginning of my relationship with God. And that was all God's doing. It had nothing to do with me. God made himself known to me. That's provenient grace. That's where it kind of starts. Then it moves into this justifying grace. Justifying grace is exactly what it says it is. We become justified because of the grace given to us through the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of God's one and only Son, Jesus Christ. And when we accept that, our sins are forgiven. And that's when we start on the path. That's when our true spiritual journey starts. It's a starting point. Once we've accepted that, then we grow towards the sanctifying grace. Okay, 
Sanctifying grace is, is basically a grace that has to do with us becoming more righteous. It is not a righteousness that saves you. It is a reflection of Jesus. It's Jesus being in you and you being in Jesus. And therefore, since you are close to Jesus, you've accepted his love. You feel his grace. You feel the freedom that he offers you. You begin to do things differently. You act differently. Old habits go away. Uh, your reactions change. Your, your idea of what love and forgiveness is morphs and, and becomes something different. And it, it, it's a path, it, it's a journey that we move along. And somewhere, each one of us is on this spectrum someplace. And sometimes we can move further ahead, sometimes we move a little back. But we need to be moving forward all the time. But all of it comes through the justifying grace. And that's where the story that Jesus tells about the two sons comes into play. I think this is the the best story in the Bible about what grace looks like. The story is in the book of Luke, chapter 15. I'm going to read verses uh, 11 through 24. This is the first part of the story. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons, the younger when said, Father, give me my share of this state. So he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth on wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So have you ever thought that the grass was greener on the other side of the hill. Any of you ever thought that? I, I have. And, you know, truth be known, sometimes it is greener on the other side of the hill. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes we just have to find out, right? Especially when we're young. Have you ever messed up so bad Done something so atrocious, said something you should never have said, hurt somebody in a way you should never have hurt them, did something just so foul that you just felt like running away. Hell, you didn't want to face it. You didn't want to. Go, you didn't want to face that person. You know, I, I I've seen people who, you know, borrowed money from me, who didn't pay it back. And what do they do? They avoid you. They run from you. <laughs> They'll even 
turn on you and start acting like you, you know, you're the bad person. They might even say rumors about you and stuff. I mean, I've had that happen. I'm sure you all have had it happen too. Uh, the no good deed goes unpunished kind of thing. You know, people will do that. I, I, I know I've been in a place where I just felt so awful and so unforgivable that I just wanted to run. I didn't want to face it. It's uncomfortable. And it might be even uncomfortable for the person I offended and hurt, right? And that, that's a good excuse not to come back. But you've got to come home. You've got to come home. Sometimes you've got to come home. Because that's where the good stuff is. The young man saw it here. I've felt that way before. You know, there's lots of people in the Bible that have felt that way. Jonah, he, he ran. Moses hid from what God wanted him to do. Look at Peter. He denied three times. He ran and hid. All the disciples ran and hid. They were ashamed. They came back, you know. They came back. Two years ago when I was here, I, I told a story. Uh, I was over at uh, Meyer looking for some arrows or so, some uh, uh, darts uh, for uh, a little thing I did here. And, and I was walking through the sporting goods section, and I found this, the hula popper, the fishing lure. I hadn't seen one of these since I was a little kid. I didn't even know they still made them. And I was so surprised. I was so shocked. And I was so excited in my heart because this meant so much to me. I hadn't seen one in years, and I thought they'd stop making them. Hula popper looks like a little frog, and, it, and it's got a plastic mouth that's curved like this. So it, you throw it out, and, and it floats on the water, and you jerk on it, and it pops. Popper, you know, hula popper. And the hula is the, 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 the strings here that hide the nasty three-pronged hook at the end of its tail. And when this is moved across the water just right, bass can't, can't help themselves. Those big mouth bass can't help themselves, and uh, they'll hit on this. And... Uh, my dad had one of these when I was a kid. It was a lot bigger than this. I think it was made of wood. And uh, I, I'd love to show it to you, but <laughs> I don't have it anymore. Uh, my dad got his hula popper from his father, and it was the star item in his tackle box. My dad's tackle box was an amazing thing. It was so beautiful, well organized. He had his little rubber worms and little minnows and his hooks and sinkers and bobbers, and then his hula popper set right there on the top. And my dad was really proud of his uh, tackle box because you know, he, he grew up poor and he didn't have much. And what he had, he took good care of. And uh, uh, his uh, tackle box was his pride and joy, and, and uh, his dad had given him that hula popper. And I wasn't allowed to touch dad's tackle box. I resented that. I still resent it. Huh. But I got it. And uh, anyway, one Christmas, Dad bought me a new fishing pole, and, uh, which is a, a torture kind of thing to do to a kid. You don't buy a new fishing pole at Christmas. You know, I couldn't use it in Indiana until spring. And uh, you know, every day I was bugging Dad during February to go fishing. And finally, uh, in early spring, Dad comes home one day from work. He says, hey, tomorrow when I get home, we're going to go fishing. I was so excited, you know, the creek behind our house had all these little fishing holes, and it's a great place to fish, and I'm finally going to get to use my rod and reel, I was like, this is going to be great. So, the next morning when I get up, it is pouring rain, and it rained all day, and I knew what that meant. When I came home from school, Dad finally came home, and at dinner, he says, Derek, we can't go fishing today, he said, the creek's flooded, he said, I drove by it, he said, it's all flooded. He said, maybe it'll come down tomorrow, or we'll go some other time. And I was heartbroke. But Dad looks at me, and he says, hey, I want to tell you something. Listen to me. Don't you ever go back to that creek playing around by yourself when it's flooded. He said, it's dangerous back there. He said, and you don't know what you get into, and you can't swim in that water. He said, don't you ever go back there. Promise me. Oh, yeah, I won't do that, Dad. And the next day comes, and it's raining in the morning. I'm thinking, you know, maybe we'll go, maybe we won't. The sun came out at noon, 
And by the time I got home, it was all sunny and nice, and I'm still hoping maybe Dad will let me go fishing. Maybe we can go fishing together. And the phone rings, and it's Dad calling Mom, saying he's got to work overtime. I knew what that meant. I meant 6.30. Yeah, it'll be dark. There's no fishing. So I sat there for a second, and I thought to myself, you know what? I could get back there. I could catch some fish. Dad won't be home till 6.30. He'll never be the wiser. I could do this. So I jump up from the table. I go out to the garage. I get my fishing pole, and I'm out the back door, and I suddenly realize I don't have any worms. What am I going to use? And I look over, and all of a sudden, whoa, there's Dad's tackle box in the corner, shining and glowing like the Ark of the Covenant. I can do this. So I go over and I grab my dad's tackle box and I head for the creek. When I get down there, it's flooded. But I didn't know any different. I, I thought I could still catch some fish, especially with dad's hula popper. <laughs> you can catch anything with the hula popper. So I took my dad's hula popper, I tie it onto my line, my brand new line, and I rear back with all my might and I make my first cast. <laughs> and the hula popper flies all the way over the creek to the other side, and it tangles in a wire fence, wraps around three or four times, and it's not going anywhere. It's stuck. And I pull and I tug, and I pull and I tug, and I pull and I tug, and finally, my line breaks, and the hula popper is on the other side of the flooded creek, and I'm in trouble. I mean, real trouble. Trouble like my kids never understood. I can't let this happen. Not dad's hula popper. He told me not to be back here. So I think, you know, I know where the shallow part of the creek is. I, surely it's not that bad. I'll just cross the creek, get the hula popper, walk down the other side of the creek as fast as I can, and I can still get home before dad. I, I might stay, save this thing anyway. So I start out, and I'm walking along, and I'm, I'm wading through the creek, and I've got the, 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 the tackle box in one hand, the fishing pole in the other, and as I walk, my boots fill up with water. And the cold water hits me, and I'm, I'm starting to chill already. And then the water gets up to my waist, and it gets in my coat. And the next thing I know, I flip, and I'm just going down the creek like this, just like a wagon wheel, flopping, flipping, upside down, all around. I'm, I, I'm scared to death. I'm going to drown. I'm going to drown. And about that time, I stomp. And lo and behold, I'm on the other side of the creek, tangled up in a fallen tree. I've been saved. And in that moment, I just, ah. Oh. And then the panic hits me. Oh, my gosh, I dropped the tackle box. <gasps> oh. I panic. I start looking for the tackle box. I, I, I'm searching under weeds and in piles, and, and I can't, can't go back into the creek. And I, you know, it's not to be found. It, it must be a mile from here by now. What am I going to do? You know, it's starting to get dark. I got to go home. How am I going to face my dad? What am I going to say? Oh my God, he's going to kill me. This is awful. I have to walk about a mile because I can't cross the creek down to the bridge so I can get across the creek and walk home. And as I'm walking, I am freezing to death. I'm shivering. I'm shaking. I, I, I'm all shook up. I just want to run away because I, I am so scared and frightened and my fear turns to embarrassment and shame. So I think to myself, my dad's so good to me. He has hardly nothing, and anything he does have, he takes care of, unlike me. And I've ruined it. One of the only things he has, I've destroyed because I was selfish and didn't do what I was told. And I started feeling so bad, so awful. I got down to the bridge, and I climb up on the bridge, and I'm kind of relieved because I'm freezing to death. And in a moment, I think, you know, maybe I'll just run away. But I can't, it's too cold. I'm frozen. I can't go. So I start walking up the hill, about an eighth of a mile, trying to think of what in the world do I say to my dad when I see him. Now I start crying. And as I'm walking, suddenly I hear in the distance, Derek, Derek, where are you? Where are you? It's my dad. I don't care. I just want to run to him. 
I'm terrified and I'm cold. And I start running and I come around the curve and there's my dad standing there. He's not a warm and fuzzy guy. He's kind of prickly. But when he saw me, he opened his arms and I just ran and jumped into his arms and he bear hugged me. And as I was hugging me, I said, Dad, I lost your tackle box. I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. And he said, I don't care. I don't care. I thought I lost you. Don't do that to me. I love you. I'll never forget it. I was safe, I was warm, and I was loved. Dad didn't say a thing about his tackle box. He did not reprimand me. I didn't even get the whooping that I thought I was going to get. He walked with me, arm around my shoulder all the way up the hill because he just knew that's what I needed, you know? And 40 years later, when I needed a hug, Worse than that, little kid needed a hug. My dad showed up when I was broken and hopeless and, and defeated. And he hugged me and he said, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. And I believed him. My dad was a good father. But he had a lot of faults and a lot of things wrong about him. But he loved me that much. God is a perfect father. And he loves you more. There's nothing you can do that you're not forgiven. There is nothing you can do that... that Divorces you from the family. There's nothing you can do that makes you no longer a son or a daughter of the king. It's up to you. This, this prodigal, he didn't have to come home. He could have fed pigs all his life, which was the worst thing a Jewish kid could ever have to do. But when he came to his senses, verse 17 says, when he came to his senses, he set out back to his father. And he didn't expect his father to bring him back into his role as a son in the family. He just wanted to be fed. He, he knew he didn't deserve that. He, he knew that he'd sinned against his father and he hadn't done right by him. But he came back anyway, out of necessity and out of need. He still had a repentant heart. And before he could even say he was sorry, he'd said he was sorry in his heart, but before he could tell his father he was sorry, the father saw him from afar, and he ran to him. And he loved him and brought him back into the family before the kid even said he was sorry. I don't care about that. You were dead, and now you're alive. You were not with us, but now you are. And what am I going to do? The, the things he did were symbolic. He got the robe that represented the family. He put the ring the, with the, probably the family crest back on his finger. He put shoes on his feet. And they didn't just welcome him back. They threw a party. Because you were once dead, but now you're alive. And that's the most important thing. What you did. I don't care. I just want you back. That's how much our Father loves us. There's nothing you can do that He can't forgive. His grace is sufficient. You, you, you deny the power of the blood of Jesus when you think that you're beyond saving it or beyond being forgiven because you're not. And, and, and the evil one the slanderer, the, the, the father of lies will whisper in your ear, you're not worthy. No one could love you. And so many of you will believe it. You're not worthy. Jesus makes you worthy. But you're part of the family. So you're welcome back at the table. So come home. 
come home. If you're out there wandering around and you're not sure if you have a place here, you do. Come home. All are welcome at the kingdom table. Jesus died for all of you. All of you are redeemed. You just got to know it. And that's the good news. That's the gospel message. That's what we all have to take, take with us. And if we remind ourselves of this over and over, we're going to tell other people about it. Everybody wants to be forgiven. Everybody wants to be a part of the family. And that's where it starts. Oh, well, Pastor Derek, that sure sounds like that all I have to do is live any way I want and all I have to do is ask for forgiveness. No, that's not what it means. No, once you really accept that forgiveness, once you know the love of Jesus, once you feel it in your heart, you'll move on to that sanctifying grace that, that, that uh, Wesley talks about. You'll see and feel a change in your life. You'll want to be different. You'll want to be different. So, friends, heaven, heaven is full of redeemed sinners. And hell is full of redeemed sinners that just don't know it. So what are we going to do? Let's tell them. Okay? Will you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the grace and the love that is given to us through your Son, Jesus. Father, let us not take advantage of it, but let us be willing to receive it, knowing that there's always a place for us at the table in the kingdom. Father, I thank you for this grace. And Lord, I thank you for the image of Jesus that I am to work into. Because Father, I know that the more I emulate him, the more fruitful my life will be. Lord, inspire me to speak up and talk about the kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Rick. Jay does a really good job of selecting music for the services, and we're going to close with uh, Let the Redeemed. That's exactly what Derek spoke to this morning. So this week, show that you're redeemed by being thankful and showing others your love. And let's, let's bring some other people into the kingdom, shall we? Stand as you're able. Let's sing together. My bitter and too sweet, and all my brothers are lifted. You took the shackles of my feet. There's no sound louder than a captive set free. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of his promises evermore. Pour out your thankfulness. Let it overflow, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. There is joy in the morning, springing up in my soul. There is life worth living, because he calls me his own. And there's a hallelujah. The sweet victory, and there's no sound louder than a captive set free. No, 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 there's no sound louder than a captive set free. And let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of his promises evermore. Pour out your thankfulness. Let it overflow and let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You are my deliverer, the freedom I'm living in. You are my deliverer, you are my promised land. Oh, you are my deliverer. 
the freedom I'm living in. Yes, you are my deliverer. You are the promised land. Oh, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of his promises take us from this place and help us to make a difference in the world this week. Father, guide our our every thought and our every care. Open our eyes to those that are lost that we might talk to them about our thankfulness for being a redeemed people, that they might become a redeemed people. And we pray for our entire community, Father. Bless this church. Bless us this week. Amen.